Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day, and uh, this is the day we commemorate the work of the late civil rights uh, leader and what he contributed to the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And just to uh, remind everybody, this was the act that um, prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or natural... Uh, national origin and also uh, ensured equal access to public places and employment. Uh, it uh, required the uh, enforcement of desegregation of schools and the right to vote really uh, monumental changing for our, our nation. And today we're going to look at this uh, subject through the lens of a family that is represented here in our Marianas community and and what the evolution of civil rights in our nation has meant to this family. It's my pleasure to introduce as our guest today, Ty Dorham. Hi, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. When was it you came to Saipan? I came uh, September 2011. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, share your family history or a bit of your family history with us today. And I think what makes your story so unique is you have found a lot of written documentation dating back hundreds of years uh, about your family, which is which is really phenomenal. Um, what motivated you to to look into your family history this way? Well, I, I always knew that we were Tuscarora Indian. I knew that we had Thai and other bloodlines in us, uh, white um, uh, as well as black. However, um, I didn't know so much about my family story. And uh, I knew my great grandfather had been labeled to be the first uh, non-white uh, veterinarian in America. But as a young adult, I uh, working as an exercise physiologist, one of my patients, mentioned to me about Dr. Dorham, and then she said her mother knew all the Dorhams. And from there, she gave me an article written about the Dorhams in 1903. And so from there, I, I start to look through the court records and, and other documents, and I found all this wonderful history about my family uh, and you know, living actually the American dream through slavery and, and other uh, different events uh, throughout life. And, and I, I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is amazing to discover, you know, this is who we are. Well, thank you so much for uh, opening the book, literally a book in front of me here that you have compiled uh, on your family history to kind of give us a, some snapshots into uh, how civil rights or the lack thereof has, has played out in the life of your family. Um, the first ancestor you have been able to trace back to is from 1086. That is unbelievable. Can you tell us something about uh, her, him? Him. <laughs> him. He actually fought with uh, William the Conqueror and so um, uh, went through uh, Doom, uh, Draper's uh, manuscript. And so from Draper's went to Doomsday uh, uh, articles and, and found uh, Barbie uh, that, that fought with William the Conqueror. And so from there, uh, that was uh, in the German uh, region, and uh, they moved from there to France, France to England, and then from England, uh, Ireland, on to America. And so uh, it, it was just amazing to think of um, the family and fighting for freedom all the way back there, you know, some uh, thousand years ago. And then he had a daughter. Yes. Uh, well, uh, from that bloodline came uh, Thomas Barbie, General Thomas Barbie. And so General Thomas Barbie fathered a, a child with a slave, and uh, her name was Lydia. Lydia married a Tuscarora Indian named Dorham. And so that's where our namesake come from, Tuscarora Indians, uh, Dorham. And you mentioned that her father actually made sure that she was provided for throughout her lifetime, which was not uh, necessarily true for, for all children uh, at that time. Correct. Uh, uh, Dorham actually 
came through the Cumberland Gap with Daniel Boone. But one of the things that uh, General Thomas Barbie wanted to make sure is that as she uh, had a family, he wanted all the sons to be educated enough to be accountants and the girls even educated. And so um, from there, they went on to, uh, to own property and to be successful business owners, um, even in Cincinnati and other places in America. And so he, he uh, made sure in his will that any family member that wanted anything from his inheritance had to make sure that they were protectors of the Dorums. And so that was the bond that he had with this, this daughter that he had with uh, a slave. Coming down through the generations uh, a bit to the abolition of slavery, you also were able to document the story of Dennis and Diadamia Dorum. Can you tell us a little bit about them and what, how their life changed uh, when they were no longer slaves? Well, uh, it's kind of a misnomer that, that we think of Dennis as a slave because um, he always lived a life of freedom. and. Um, he had a brother named Daniel. Daniel and Dennis, their lives mimicked Thomas and his brother Joshua. Now, and who so, were Thomas and Joshua? Joshua Barbie and, Tom, and uh, Thomas Barbie. So uh, Thomas is my great, 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 great grandfather, uh, five times removed, first postmaster west of the Alleghenies and general of Fort Washington, which later became Cincinnati. And so then Joshua, his brother, actually became the second postmaster west of the Alleghenies after uh, General Thomas Barbie. And so uh, Dennis and Daniel were successful businessmen, uh, owned rope factories, horse factories. Um, uh, Dennis at one time was the third wealthiest uh, non-white, uh, well he was the wealthiest non-white but third wealthiest citizen of Kentucky at one time. And Kentucky actually used to be Fincastle County, Virginia, and then it later became uh, Kentucky with three counties and then it became a, a state in itself. So he was black but he still had uh, all these rights to own land and right. stuff like that but he didn't have the he didn't have equal rights I think. Right. Be, uh, one, of, one of the things uh, just so amazing is that you have uh, one of the largest landowners and at any time he was threatened with uh, the fact that he was a mulatto man and so again, fa uh, father, mother being half uh, white, half black, and then father being Tuscarora Indian. And so uh, as uh, different counties were being formed from larger counties, uh, his grandchildren actually were sold into slavery because they didn't have free papers in the newly formed counties. And so, uh, so you know, imagine that here you are, the third wealthiest man in, in this community or, or the state, and, and free and free and then all of a sudden anyone can come and pick up your grandchildren or your your children and sell them into slavery and so uh, what a nightmare what what stress and anxiety you have to live with every day to to want to be a proud representative of your community proud leader of your family but know that all of that could be stripped away at any time you know for any reason and so you know uh, it, it it really amazes me that he was allowed, he allowed himself to um, be as tactful as he, he was to be able to exist throughout those times. A, a couple other uh, individuals in your family tree are probably well known to many of our listeners. That being uh, Fred, 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 Frederick Douglass, the American uh, social reformist and abolitionist, and Booker T. Washington, of course, educator, author. He was the advisor to multiple presidents. Um, tell us a little bit about how they were alike and how they were different. I think they were alike because both of them uh, were trailblazers. And so they had vision that was beyond what uh, the every day um, African-American citizen was, was um, allowing themselves to, to experience. And so they saw a different world and a different opportunity. They were, and uh, that was uh, similarities, but however, both had different visions on, on how to get there. Um, of course, uh, with, uh, with Douglas, his um, family and, you know, he, he actually, his, his real name is Bailey, his real last name is Bailey, not Douglas, but that's the name that he took. 
and the family, they actually taught him to read. They taught him to be independent. They taught him to be strong. And so he looked for immediate acceptance, immediate um, equal rights and freedom, and that the world can be ours. Uh, Booker T. Washington, on the other hand, said that we must accept the reality of the America we live in today and take what they give us and what they give us, then make the most of that and try to rise above it. And so with that, that, that created a conflict within the family because one says, I am equal, I am, I am a human, just as you are. And the other says, yes, I'm a human, but I'm going to accept what you give me and I'll make the most of it. And so, and we can look at some of those things in all cultures, the food that we eat. Sometimes, you know, uh, some of the most delicious meals that we eat uh, worldwide have been those that have gotten the scraps from the table and they made the most of that meal. And then everyone says, oh, you know, this is so great. I have to go to this community to get this food, I have to go to that community. And so, in, in essence, he was doing some of the things that we already were doing, but um, uh, the Douglas side of the family just didn't see that accepting a handout and trying to make the most of a handout was really allowing you to be the human that you're supposed to be. I, I think uh, we would all agree that, you know, there's still work to be done uh, in ensuring equal, equal rights among everybody in America based on um, these categories. When it comes to Frederick Douglass's approach to the issue and versus Booker T. Washington. Where do you think you fall as a modern day man? As a modern day man, I think I'm more aligned with the Douglass. Um, I, I just see the world as my, my oyster, as my footstool. And um, I, I don't think there's any limit to what any of us can do if we put our minds to that challenge. And so uh, my father always told me I could be president if I work that hard. And unfortunately, I haven't chosen to work that hard, and, uh, but I, I believe that. And I believe that in all of our citizens, if we just help them to reach that threshold of believing in themselves, then they can achieve. Regardless of the environment, you can achieve. And so that is my job, to help them as a facilitator of their success, not where I've been in life, but where they can be. It's a great message for really approaching any obstacle you may face in life. Um, our guest today is Ty Dorham. We'll be back after this break. Did you know that you can donate up to $5,000 to the Humanities Council through the CNMI Education Tax Credit Program? Donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax, BGRT, and earnings tax. Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma Asi, Olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We're looking at Martin Luther King Jr. Day today through the uh, perspective of a family represented in our community by Ty Dorham. Uh, he's lived here for a number of years. Ty, first of all, I just think it's so wonderful that you have really this treasure trove of, of history about your family that many people do not have, uh, either because there's no written record available or um, they haven't taken the time to go through. And so it, it's really great to be able to see all these people that are part of making who you are today. Uh, one of those being the uh, Dr. Thomas Madison Dorham, who was uh, one of the first, if not the first, black veterinar veterinarian uh, in America. Share it with us a little about, about him. Right. Well, um, I, I always heard the rumors that he was the first. And, you know, and uh, of course, everybody wants to create the storyline that we were the first. But um, I actually found out that he actually was the first. And uh, uh, just, just really amazing that he... Uh, coming from a farm in, in Kentucky and, and going to a college uh, and that's where he met his wife who was uh, part of the Hancock family as well but um, he uh, not only worked and, and was uh, number one graduate in his class he studied veterinary medicine and regular medicine and he also worked as a carpenter while in college and so um, it's just amazing for any family to, to have someone to represent them in, in that manner and so it really drives me to to want to do my best in every arena that I I'm in because I I need to represent 
you know, my, my family's bloodline. Now, he was actually your great-grandfather? He was my great-grandfather. Um, do you, were there any stories in your family, uh, oral histories, uh, about what life was like for him or? Well, um, life for him was, uh, he, he actually was really a prominent man uh, within all of Kentucky and, and so he was constantly on the road traveling uh, from place to place and, and again, he's more famous as a veterinarian so actually when I came here, Dr. Tudor knew of my great-grandfather because, uh, the local uh, vet because he uh, said they mentioned him in school. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, that, that made me proud. But he also, again, practiced regular medicine. And so... Uh, Wait, regular medicine? He was a doctor doctor? A doctor, yes. So he went to McKillop uh, School of Me uh, Medicine and, in Evanston, Illinois. Okay. And so, and uh, just, you know, a, a, a wonderful history about him. And, and all of his brothers and sisters attended college uh, from, from Berea College in Kentucky to uh, Oberdeen. In Ohio, and uh, and so it was uh, just really amazing to see this family whose father fought in the Civil War, and the father's brothers fought in the Civil War, to um, to the next generation. All of them are going to college, and all of them are successful, and uh, it, it's just really amazing to me that again, no matter what life deals you, when you hear that expression, if it gives you lemons, make lemonade. They, they made lemonade and, and they, they made the most of that lemonade. And so, um, again, no matter what situation I feel like I'm in, I feel like I, I always have that opportunity to win uh, because I, I come from a resilient family that refused to quit. Hmm. You're also related to the first black uh, mayor of Atlanta, uh, an individual who actually marched with Dr. King, Andrew Young. What is your relation with him? Andrew Young uh, comes to our, our family through an extended uh, relationship. So he is, uh, to my grandfather, he is a third cousin. And so um, uh, he actually, they, they met in Washington, D.C. when he was a college student there. So they really didn't know because... Uh, several of the family had kind of separated, so we actually had a lot of family that lived in Tuscaro uh, uh, I'm sorry, Tuscaloosa. So um, one of the first uh, black um, uh, Tuskegee Airmen uh, was uh, a Durham, and so he met Dr. Ma uh, Thomas Madison's family there when he was visiting the part of the uh, Booker T. Washington family there, and so. Uh, so that, those bloodlines kind of reconnected in Alabama as well as in Washington, D.C. And so from there, a lot of the family in D.C. start to take up um, issues with uh, Andrew Young on, on the, um, the rights of individuals of, of color. Uh, and it is, the irony is, is that most of the Dorums appear as white. <laughs> and so, so a lot of times they would send them in and have them to be the ones to go in and then, all right, we're black. And so, um, and they, uh, the, of course, the white communities didn't believe it, but then um, they, they would be the ones going in and be the instigator of trying to make change. And so uh, it's, it's just amazing to see that so many lines of my family from, from the dorms, not only touching uh, presidents and things like that, but uh, books written where they're working with Harriet Tubman now you have uh, an individual marching with Dr. King. And so, um, again, um, I, I just feel like the weight of, of all of those relatives, not necessarily on my shoulders pushing me down, but pushing me forward. And so uh, just, just really amazing that he overcame um, all these obstacles and he rose above, became the uh, first uh, black mayor of Atlanta and continued to, to make that city prosper and, and so you see the the excellence and the greatness that has uh, rose from from that that community in the south we're sitting here in your office and behind you on the wall um, are pictures of your family dating back to who's who's the oldest the painting up there in the middle that's Dennis Dorham and his wife okay. Damia um, and now coming down to you today what does uh, Martin Luther King Day mean to you personally? Martin Luther King Day means to me is that um, 
a, a whole lot of things because I, I look at the transformation of his life. A lot of people don't know that at 16 years old, he actually started Boston University and he fell in love with a, a white lady. And so he wanted to marry her. Unfortunately, unfortunately, her father was the president of the university. And so um, he removed her from the university. And Martin actually went back home and his father introduced him to Coret, uh, uh, his wife, uh, Coretta Scott King. So, um, so him going through these personal struggles allowed him, I think, to understand the struggles of, of the American people as a whole, especially the, the black or African Americans. And so for me, um, him taking those struggles and still pushing forward, forging um, a, a pathway for us to move through this future and wanting us to, to not only be equal, but to be better than that. You know, every day you should strive for your excellence. And, and I think every race, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't get offended if a white man says that he wants to be the best he can be. I should encourage him to be that instead of thinking of it as, uh, as being prejudiced. And so uh, I think Dr. King wanted all of us to strive to be excellent. And uh, in doing that, recognize and respect and show tolerance towards others who are a little bit different than you. And so um, with that, it gives me the opportunity each day to strive and to know that no matter what, even with all the faults of America, I still can reach my excellence. Do you feel that here in the Marianas, we are living King's dream? I, um, I think we're trying. I, I think um, we're still young as a, as, you know, a nation or a state. And um, because of that, it hasn't given us the opportunity to actually reach across the threshold to help as many others as, as we can. You still see the ethnic differences as far as uh, which island group is represented or which is, is strongest and uh, Carolinian versus Chamorro uh, versus Chukis and things. And then also I still see that um, uh, no matter our, our, the hue of our skin, you still see a little bit difference as, as um, African Americans are treated out here. Uh, so I, I think we're growing, but at the same time, I think that um, we're still young. And so we're still trying to figure out who we are economically, socially, and, and um, you know, morally as a people. But um, I think, and, and, and that's more from the government, but as, as far as the people, I think there's no greater set of, of beauty in the world that I've experienced than the people in the Marianas. And so uh, I tell my friends all the time, I never have to cook. If I walk to the beach every single day, Mr. Ty, come on, eat with us. Come to the front of the line. And so I think the 30 pounds I've picked up since I've been here is proof of that. But um, wonderful, wonderful people. And it's just a shame I, I don't feel that the government or our school system has really done what they needed to do to reach all the citizens of the CNMI. I know part of your work also is advocating for people with disabilities. Um, how, how do you um, feel the Marianas is uh, performing in that, in that area, in your experience? I, um, when I first got here, I thought we were 20, 30 years behind. Um, I, I, Dr. Rita Sablon, Suzanne uh, Lazama, they really worked with me and they trusted me. Uh, Suzanne and Dr. Uh, Sublime would tell me, uh, Ty, go and do what you need to do. I trust you. After uh, they left, uh, my role kind of changed and I felt like I've been pushed to the background. But I'm really excited about um, Donna Flores as, as the new director of special ed and I've pledged my uh, support to, to help her to be the best as she can be. And uh, I think we're growing and, and that's the most important thing. So instead of 20, 30 years behind right now, I think we're, we're really progressing and we're getting to where we need to be. But inclusion doesn't mean we all learn in the same classroom. It means we all get to learn from the same source of information where we best can learn. And so it is still taking the CNMI a, a long time to get realization of that because we're trying to force everybody into the same classroom. So if I have to sign to you to get you to understand a lesson about time I can sign and explain something, the teacher's already moved on to two or three other topics and so we've got to understand that inclusion means being able to give you the information you need from the same sources 
where you best can learn it. And, and we're, we're moving towards understanding that, uh, regardless of the disability. We talked uh, most of this show about uh, individuals in your family history and um, how they're perceived through the lens of, of us now in the future. How would you like to be uh, looked back at by your descendants in relation to um, your life in general and, and civil rights? Well, I, I think um, most of my family, they know that I, I strive to do what's right in life. Uh, I'm, I'm someone who always want, wants to say that if I talk something, I'm going to walk it. And so that, that means a whole lot to me. And with my wife being from China, a lot of times she was like, oh, you're always worried about imagery. And I was like, it means a whole lot because first impressions, they are lasting impressions. And so I want to make sure that people feel comfortable enough that they can trust what we're trying to do for them. And so uh, for me, uh, in all my experiences and all my, my family, I think uh, the greatest legacy I could ever leave my, my children and future generations is that everybody you meet, you know, uh, everybody you touch, touch in a way that you've inspired them today. And so it doesn't matter where I've been in life if I can't help you to be the best that you can be. And so, um, I, as I said, I, I am a facilitator of your success. And uh, if I only brag about the things I've done, if I only talk about my degrees and all the accolades that I, I've had, uh, then I failed in trying to reach you and, and helping you to be the best as you can be. And so and I, I think that's the greatest legacy that I, I can leave. And so I'm, I'm hoping that my, my children um, will follow along in, in the, those steps. We've been chatting today with Ty Dorham, a uh, resident of the Marianas for almost a decade now about uh, Martin Luther King Day through the perspective of his uh, rich family history and his life today. Ty, thank you so much. Any final thoughts before we go? Well, I, I really appreciate what you do. Uh, my, my first degree was cultural anthropology, and so humanities is, is where I, I believe that the strength of our nation should be, and I, I think that we need to replace that uh, back in our school systems and we, we will put not only humane individuals but individuals filled with love for humanity and so um, thank you for doing what you do in our community and being able to share the, the wonderful stories about uh, other individuals that live here and, and their experiences here as well as the uh, experience of the Islanders and so thank you. Thank you so much. Yes ma'am. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Katherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.